Good morning, everyone. As I announced on Friday, we're changing the order of our press conference presentations. Today, Commissioner Pichek will present our latest data and modeling, as well as our travel map, and will continue to do so every Tuesday. And we'll move our regular education updates to Fridays. However, Secretary French will be making an announcement today regarding the many questions we received about moving schools from step two to step three. Our goal in presenting the modeling earlier in the week is to help make it easier for travelers to plan so they can follow the travel and quarantine policy and our lodging facilities will have more time to help them do so. As a reminder, lodging facilities are now able to rent all rooms. But again, all of the safety protocols and requirements will remain in place. This will increase the number of rooms rented, but does not change capacity in gathering areas like dining or event space. I also want to be clear about the bar seating change because I've seen some misinformation out there. This change did not increase capacity at bars and restaurants. Bar and restaurant capacity remains at 50%, which has been the limit since June 26, about three months ago. This change was simply to allow seating at the bar counter, and they still will have to comply with the 50% capacity and all other safety measures within the guidance as well. The reaction to last week's announcements and what I expect we'll hear after Secretary French's announcement today is similar to what we've experienced throughout this pandemic. Some feel we're, way, we're moving way too fast and others believe we're, way, we're moving way too slow. I get it. We've all been living with so much uncertainty since March. Everything about our lives has been turned upside down. And uh, as we await for a vaccine, we don't know how long we're going to be in this position. And all of this, plus the alarming trends we've seen in other parts of the country and the detrimental impact on our economy creates fear. Fear about your health and the health of your family. Fear about your job and how you'll put food on the table. Fear about whether you can afford to keep your business open. Fear about whether your kids are falling behind and if they'll ever catch up. I understand all that, but please know, we keep these concerns in mind every day and with every decision. This is why I put such an emphasis on the data, the science, and most importantly, the expertise of the teams at health, education, emergency management, and others. Because there are no easy answers. Every decision we make, whether it's to move forward, to stay where we are, has ripple effects somewhere else. And we think about the ramifications at every turn. For example, when we take a step forward, we frequently hear from the other side. Well, if it's safe to do X, why isn't it safe to do Y? And from the other side, we hear, if it's not safe to do Y, how is it safe to do X? The fact is, we know enough about managing this disease where most activities with safety measures in place would be safe if they were done in a vacuum. But that's not reality. We don't live in a vacuum. Everything is intertwined with something else and we have to look at the big picture. This is why we've taken a methodical approach, one quarter turn at a time, so we can open the spigot a little, see what happens, then open it a little more. And this strategy has worked. We lead the country in so many ways when it comes to suppressing this virus. So this is the approach we're going to continue to take and we'll continue getting up here twice a week and answering your questions so you understand what we're doing and why we're doing it this way. Now, I know this is hard. 
and I know many are tired of dealing with this pandemic, especially with so much going on in the world. But if we stick together, if we continue to pull in the same direction against a common, common enemy, which in this case is the virus, we'll get through this and we'll be stronger for it. So with that, I'll now turn it over to Secretary French for an education announcement. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Governor. Good morning. I wanted to follow up on my comments from last week regarding a change in step levels for our health guidance in schools. Our guidance includes two levels of mitigation strategies that schools need to follow to ensure their safe operations. Step two is the more stringent level. Step three, on the other hand, still requires the stringent measures, but under step three, schools have additional flexibility on how to, how to implement them. We opened our schools under step two to give schools the opportunity to practice the implementation of the more strict requirements. But we also anticipated moving to step three towards the end of September. Our decision in determining the step levels for schools is based on a consideration of two variables. First variable is the overall health conditions for the virus in Vermont. In spite of the few cases we have seen in schools, the conditions remain very positive. The cases we have seen in schools were the result of the virus essentially being brought to school. To date, we have not seen transmission of the virus in schools. The other variable for our decision making is an assessment of to what extent schools are being able to implement our required health guidance. We measure this subjectively through anecdotal observation based on our frequent if not daily conversations with principals and superintendents. We also measure compliance with the health guidance more objectively by looking at the health data, which as I mentioned previously is, remains positive in spite of the small number of cases we have seen in schools so far. Based on our review of these considerations, we are announcing all schools will be placed on step three effective September 26th, which is this Saturday. We decided to make the transition date on a Saturday since the change in step level is also connected to our sports guidance. Moving to step three will permit the start of interscholastic competitions this weekend. We wanted to give our student athletes an extra weekend for what has already been a shortened season. This is particularly important for our students participating in activities that have short seasons to begin with, such as bass fishing and golf. In terms of school operations, step three should not be viewed as relaxing the necessary, necessary mitigation strategies schools need to follow. All of the basic mitigation strategies, such as staying at home when you're sick, completing the daily health check, wearing a facial covering, social distancing, and washing your hands and, uh, remain in place and must be followed. Under step three, schools may consider the use of common areas such as gyms and cafeterias. Under step two, these communal spaces were not allowed to be utilized for their normal purposes. Under step three, schools may consider using these spaces again for their intended purposes, but with smaller student group sizes, staggering the use of the space, and ensuring cleaning and disinfection between uses. Under step three, schools also have greater flexibility in grouping students during the day. Under step two, schools are required to keep the same groups of students together whenever feasible, what we call the pod model. Under step three, schools have more flexibility in grouping students. Pod configurations remain an important consideration, but strict adherence to this model is not required under step three. This will provide additional flexibility for grouping students by academic subject, which is a very important consideration, particularly for high schools. In summary, we'll be placing all schools on step three effective this Saturday, September 26th. The change in step level does not change to what extent a district may offer in-person instruction or not. That decision remains a decision for the local school district. We know, however, that in-person instruction is very important for the healthy development and academic success of our students, particularly for our youngest students. So we believe it is critical to continue to work towards more in-person instruction while the conditions are optimal to do so. Moving to step three will give schools additional flexibility to provide more in-person instruction. That being said, 
We will continue to closely monitor the health conditions and the ability of our schools to implement the required health guidance. And we will not hesitate to move back to step two to ensure the safety of our students and staff. On behalf of our students and schools, I'd like to thank all Vermonters for their support over the last several months. Vermont has the best conditions in the country based on your willingness to work together and to do what is best to keep us all safe. Your attention in following our guidance has allowed us to open our schools safely, but we cannot let our guard down now. If we want to keep schools open and do what is best for our kids, we have to continue to work together. Thank you again for your support. Now I'll now turn it over to Dr. Levine. Good morning. I'll make uh, the health update and cases update a bit abbreviated as Commissioner Pichak will be going into greater detail this morning. But as of today, we are at 1,721 cases, having recorded only 15 cases in the past four days. While our nation prepares to record its tragic 200,000th death, probably today, Vermont remains at 58 deaths, with none recorded in 56 days. As you've heard from Secretary French, as of this morning, we've had a small number of cases reported at a total of three schools in Vermont since the start of the school year. The most recent reported over the weekend involving Williamstown Middle and High School. Our contact tracing team has reached close contacts. Everyone has received the guidance and any instructions for quarantining as appropriate. At the last few press conferences, I've been talking about how we expect an increase in cases as schools reopen and we start to spend more time indoors as the weather cools off. The good news is that as of today, two weeks in, we have seen no COVID-19 transmission within K-12 schools. Among the current cases associated with the three schools, none of the people who tested positive got the virus due to being in school. Based on our investigations, all had been exposed prior to classes beginning. <laughs> Even if they were potentially infectious for a day in school, Adherence to physical distancing and masking guidance have been and remain critical strategies for students and staff to continue to adhere to. Vermont's experience stands out against what is unfortunately happening in many other states as they reopen their schools. One important reason for our success thus far is that our school administrators, teachers, and staff have been literally moving mountains to create safe and healthy learning environments for our children and workplaces for their staff. The health department, together with the Agency of Education and others throughout state government, have been closely working with superintendents, principals, and school nurses to support that work. All are full partners in preparing for and responding swiftly when we find virus spreading in a school. You'll notice I said when and not if we find the virus spreading in a school. COVID-19 is highly contagious. That's why wearing masks and physical distancing are so important to preventing a single child or adult from spreading the virus. But I have an important message to parents, caregivers, and school personnel. Any cases of the virus in your school is not a failure on your part any more than your child getting sick at home is a failure. It is the nature of this virus to be easily transmitted from person to person. We're all doing our level best to prevent its spread, and no person or school should be singled out to be blamed or stigmatized. I mentioned stigma at our last press conference and got several questions on it, and we've provided some pointers in our daily update. I'd like to briefly focus on it again. First, by repeating what I've just emphasized, no single person or group of people are more likely than others to spread COVID-19. 
This is key because stigma is associated with a lack of knowledge of how COVID-19 spreads, which fuels fears about disease and death, gossip that spreads rumors and false information, and a need to place blame. Stigma hurts everyone by creating fear or anger toward ordinary people, instead of focusing on the disease that is causing the problem. I've seen it over the course of this pandemic, directed at ethnic groups, congregate housing complexes, businesses, travelers, childcare settings. I would not want it to be directed at a school that happened to have a small number of COVID cases among its students or staff. So how can we reduce stigma? First, maintain the privacy and confidentiality of people seeking health care and of those who, who may be part of any contact investigation. That is why my staff at the health department are so fiercely protective of Vermont's and Vermonters' personal and private information. Second, quickly communicate the risk or lack of risk from contact with patients, people, products, and places. Third, correct negative language by sharing accurate information about how the virus spreads. It is in the air we breathe. Fourth, speak out against negative behaviors and, st and statements, including those on social media. Returning now to our Vermont management of the pandemic and our schools, we have been more successful than nearly anyone else in the country. We know this by our still low rate of virus in the state. When there is a case in a school, we will quickly act to investigate the situation and take all appropriate steps to contain its spread. This starts with expert contact tracing. And again, if you get a call from the health department, we are all counting on you to answer the phone and speak with our team. They will advise quarantine as appropriate and strongly recommend PCR testing for those people they determine to be close contacts and give everyone who may have been affected the information and guidance they need. By the way, there is good news for anyone who does need to get tested. There are now more of the nasal swabs available, so less of the brain tickling that many of us have enjoyed thus far. I have one additional but important point for schools and families. It's a reminder that people may have the virus and not yet know it. You may not have any symptoms, or you may have mild symptoms and not recognize them as possibly being COVID-19. So if your child doesn't normally have a headache or cough or congestion or any of the possible milder symptoms of the virus, then keep them home and let the school nurse know why. And if the symptoms persist, call your child's pediatrician for advice. You can find a list of the symptoms at our website, healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19. But it's been several months, so just to review them again, as the students may actually know them better than the adults now. Fever, 100.4 or higher. Cough, shortness of breath or difficulty breathing. Chills, fatigue, muscle pain or aches. Headache new loss of taste or smell, congestion or runny nose, nausea, vomiting, or diarrhea. Finally, I will close with a comment regarding how the virus is transmitted to others. Yesterday, <clears throat> in yet another public re relations fiasco with overtones of politicization, the CDC abruptly dropped, dropped new guidance from its website about airborne transmission of the coronavirus, just days after publishing it. The agency said a draft version was posted in error before it had gone through the normal review process and then reverted to its previous guidance, which does not mention airborne transmission. Keep in mind, this speaker and scientists across the country and for that matter, the world, have been calling for the risk of airborne transmission to be recognized by health authorities. In many ways, it is why our advice about distancing, masking, and time spent in indoor settings are such fundamental parts of our health guidance. Recommendations that will only become more relevant to Vermonters as we begin to hunker down for the winter. 
So expect to see more news consistent with this guidance from the CDC in the coming days. And know that, as always, we in Vermont will be guided by the science. I'll now turn it over to Commissioner Pichak. Thank you, Dr. Levine, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so we'll begin today's uh, presentation uh, like we have in the past few weeks with an update on some national data and national trends, focusing also on that grim milestone that Dr. Levine mentioned of crossing 200,000 COVID deaths uh, likely today at the end of the day, uh, and then focus on uh, Vermont data, uh, our forecast, um, turning to a higher education and K-12 through update on data, uh, and then completing uh, it with the uh, regional uh, information and uh, the travel map. So turning to that grim milestone, uh, based on data from Johns Hopkins University, uh, by the conclusion of today, uh, all probability the United States will cross 200,000 deaths since the start of the pandemic. Uh, obviously a grim milestone, um, but it does again highlight the success that we have had here in Vermont. Um, we've talked a lot about hospitalizations and cases and how our case counts are low but also our death rate uh, has been very low throughout the pandemic. Obviously, those are all interconnected uh, and important. Uh, when you look at the uh, amount of deaths per capita from the beginning of the pandemic and just going all the way back to January to today, you see that Vermont uh, is very low on that ranking, uh, only having Hawaii, Wyoming, and Alaska having a lower uh, death rate. Uh, however, if you do remember at the beginning of the pandemic, there were uh, outbreaks in Vermont, particularly a few in long-term care facilities. So we did have more deaths per capita early on uh, in the pandemic. If you measure it just from the period of time when we started to more fully reopen our economy, uh, and as others did as well from May 15th, you'll see that clearly Vermont has the lowest uh, per capita death numbers uh, in the country uh, by quite a bit. So we're very fortunate that um, our state has responded in the way that it has because it doesn't just keep our case counts low, it keeps people alive and it keeps Vermonters safe, which is a very uh, good thing. Wanting to point out also, we hear some discussion about, you know, who makes up the 200,000 deaths are these people that potentially would have uh, passed away from some other ailment anyway. And we think it's important just to look at the data. Um, right here on this next slide, we have the number of deaths on average for the past five years, 2015 to 2019. It's a pretty consistent, um, uh, you know, uh, average it is higher in the winter, lower in the summer and the spring. Um, but then when you flip ahead and look at the number of deaths from 2020, you see that there is a dramatic increase in 2020. Uh, again, really just shocking when you look at those numbers and see that clearly it's a deviation from the norm that we've seen uh, over the past five years. Then when you dig a little deeper on that and look at how many of those deaths that deviate from that mean are related to COVID, which is that red part of the, of the uh, uptick, you can see that there are still a number of non-COVID related deaths or not reported as COVID related deaths uh, that still are in excess of what we would see uh, in a normal year. So certainly um, tragic 200,000 COVID deaths, but the impact uh, is also beyond that as well. Turning to the national cases, uh, again, you can see by the 30 day map that Vermont continues to have a really low uh, prevalence of the virus, which obviously is excellent news as we continue K through 12 and higher ed reopening. Uh, really, it really stands out even in the Northeast as having really low prevalence, but the Northeast itself remains uh, rather strong. Turning to the national cases per day, I do want to point this chart out because you can see from last Friday, we talked about a slight increase in cases and that increase has continued. Again, we'll watch this closely. Uh, it's either uh, post Labor Day increased in testing or post Labor Day increase in infections, potentially K through 12 higher ed restart across the country. All of those things are possible, but we'll certainly will watch um, that number nationally and regionally very closely. And then breaking it out by region, you can see that the South is seeing an increase in cases a little bit more prominently than uh, the West and the Midwest, but those areas are also seeing an increase in cases, as is the Northeast, although much more slight than the other regions of the uh, country. So turning now to the Vermont data, uh, since it is the first day of fall, we thought we'd just look back uh, on the summer uh, season and see uh, what our numbers held for that period. You can see we conducted over 188,000 tests, uh, 559 positives, 
uh, in Vermont throughout the summer for a very low positivity rate. Uh, and again, fortunately, very few people in the hospital uh, in that period of time, whether in general hospital beds or in the ICU. Uh, and we did record three deaths over the summer, but again, um, fortunately, much, much uh, less uh, in terms of the number of deaths than other parts of the country have experienced during this pandemic. The weekly totals, we now will report on weekly totals from Tuesday to Monday rather than Friday to Thursday. So we went back and changed all the data uh, for previous weeks. You'll see that um, we're down this week, 25 cases compared to the seven days uh, over the prior period of time, which was 40, uh, 45 cases. So uh, case count remains uh, very low. Uh, we continue to have the lowest positivity rate uh, in the country, the lowest uh, prevalence since the start of the pandemic uh, as well. Flipping ahead, we see that there is a forecast that we've created in here. We did not include our Oliver Wyman forecast. That will be updated for next Tuesday, but this is another model that we look at that just shows where are the counties that are likely to see growth and where are the counties that are likely to see decreases over the next two to three weeks. You can see some parts of the Northeast are slated for increases. Others will see improvement. The three counties in Vermont, uh, based on this model, were very slight increases. So again, nothing that gives us pause for concern, uh, but something we're gonna continue to look closely at because the national numbers are going up uh, as are uh, the regional numbers. In terms of our restart metrics, these are all uh, trending in the right direction. Syndromic surveillance is low. Uh, growth rate is low, positivity remains very low, uh, and the number of people um, and facility that we have to treat people uh, remains very high. So we have plenty of hospital capacity with two people in the hospital today and no one, fortunately, in the ICU. Turning to the K through 12 and, and higher ed update, again, this is just from Friday, so there's not much to refresh here, but as Dr. Levine and um, Secretary French pointed out, there was a new case in Vermont, so we're up to four cases. New Hampshire has seen an increase of 10 cases since Friday when we last updated. They now have 33 cases impacting 22 schools. And Maine saw four new cases uh, since Friday impacting six of their schools. So uh, across the region, low prevalence and seen rather mild uh, cases. But Vermont clearly uh, continuing to do really strong uh, in terms of its reopening. From the college front, there are about another 2,100 tests that were conducted since Friday. One new positive uh, recorded uh, in the numbers, so 43 uh, potential total positive cases now for higher education, still a very low positivity rate, uh, successful uh, reopening uh, in that regard. Looking at the regional data, we do see cases increasing uh, week over week. This is something we saw last week as well. I will point out that there was a large increase. We, we include Quebec in this regional forecast, anticipating that at some point the border would be open and they would be included in our sort of regional focus. But I will point out that Quebec has seen a, a, an increase pretty significant compared to the other states around us. So that is accounting for a lot of the increase uh, that we're seeing the last couple of weeks. So I think that's something important context to point out. But we are seeing uh, increases across um, the region as well. Again, you can see that difference when you look at week over week that the last four weeks we have seen an uptick uh, across the region. A lot of it due to Quebec, but not all of it uh, necessarily. Other states are seeing increases as well. Lastly, turning to our travel map, you see those increases uh, impacting the map. Uh, some places in uh, New Hampshire and Maine are now uh, in the yellow or red category. There was some improvement along the western border of Vermont for those counties that are in the, tr the uh, New York upstate tri-state area or tri-city area. So there is some improvement there, but overall, the map is rather flat um, and is down a little bit. So um, something that we will uh, continue to focus on, we'll update it every Tuesday going forward, uh, and we'll have sort of a consistent point in time uh, from now forward, which I think will be helpful uh, for those anticipating travel. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the governor. Thank you very much, Commissioner Pichek. And with that, we'll open it up for questions. All right, it is 11.35 and we do have a long queue today, so I'm gonna ask folks to keep it to one or two questions rather than three or four or more. Uh, we'll start with Calvin. All right, uh, thank you, Governor. Um, so the legislative session uh, actually could be coming to a wrap uh, by the end of this week. Um, I'm just kind of hoping to get, gather your, your kind of final thoughts on it. It's been a marathon legislative session. Uh, you know, at the beginning, there was lots of agreement between Democrats, Republicans, yourself, working with the Speaker and the Pro Tem. 
Um, I'm just, as I said, hoping to get your final thoughts, and maybe we'll continue to see that at bipartisan uh, support, I guess. Yes. It's been a, a difficult year in so many different respects, uh, whether it's individually or with the legislature, uh, going to a remote type of, uh, uh, of a, a meeting process uh, has uh, been challenging uh, in many respects. And, um, and we're all trying to do whatever we can to continue uh, to inform each other and to make sure that we're protecting Vermonters. So, uh, high level, uh, we've done a lot of good work. I think the uh, the budget uh, that we presented, uh, the three quarter budget uh, that uh, that we presented to the legislature, and, and all you know when you look at it uh, again from a thirty thousand foot view, I think a lot of the measures were adopted. Um, so that's good news. Uh, been some disappointments uh, along the way as well, but uh, we'll work our way through that as well. And uh, continue to take the high road and uh, do what's what's right for Vermont. And it appears that the uh, Senate just this afternoon passed S fifty four cannabis bill. Um, I know there's still some concerns from, from racial justice advocates and also some in the ag community. Um, have you seen the final version? Where do you stand on that? Yeah, I have not. Uh, as you said, uh, it's just. Uh, Past the final stages today, I believe, uh, in the Senate. Uh, at that point in time, it typically goes through the leg Legislative Council uh, to make sure that everything is correct and then gets sent to us and we have some time to look that over as well. So um, I, I don't know when we'll get the bill, um, but we'll, we'll take a look. We'll reflect on all the uh, areas of disagreement and uh, then I'll make a decision from there. All right, Ross. Uh, it's for Secretary French. Um, I know of at least a, a few school districts that have been operating under a hybrid model since the first day of school and are starting to transition uh, within the next coming weeks back to full in person. I understand that decision lies with the districts. Um, with, from your perspective, though, kind of from the top down, uh, what, what more needs to happen for more schools to kind of take that next step and bringing more kids back into in person learning? Uh, and when do they know that they're ready? Yeah, I mean, that last question, I think, is the important one because it really gets to, uh, you know, the practical aspects of implementing fairly complex guidance that we've created for schools. And it's, you know, that measure of people being comfortable in their operations and safe operations that is sort of a necessary precondition. So I know, speaking for all educators, they're very anxious to return to normal and to as much in-person as instruction as possible. Uh, but that is predicated on the operational safety of their buildings, and part of that assessment is their comfort level and consistency in doing that. So, I, you know, so far we're very pleased, uh, as I mentioned, almost daily contact uh, with school districts. We're very pleased to the extent that people have been able to implement this fairly complex and stringent uh, guidance. Um, so, in, as you notice, we're seeing that trend towards more in-person instruction, which I think is critical, particularly this time of year, when arguably the conditions are going to be the best as they're going to be going into the winter. Uh, so we'll monitor that. I will be doing a monthly data collection, but um, so far I'm very pleased with the progress districts are making and hopefully we'll see more in-person instruction, particularly with the younger students, which I think we all know is developmentally so critical for them. And, and, and as far as just following up on the sports resuming, uh, we're fast approaching maybe winter sports season, sports right. like basketball and volleyball and things like that to take place inside a gym. Will there be new guidance that comes out for those types of sports that happen close contact and inside, not out in the field with a ball threes going across? Yeah, well, we decide to do, um, and Secretary Morris has been sort of leading this up in cooperation with VPA and others. Uh, it's a fairly complex process. We decided to issue guidance on fall sports first, uh, and then we'll take up the issue of winter sports here shortly. Um, but, you know, we part of it was just to let the conditions play out a bit. Uh, but as you, you mentioned, the, the issues of indoor activities are, are more uh, significant relative to our health considerations. So hopefully we'll have some guidance out for winter sports here in October. Thank you. Steve? Uh, Governor, your reaction or maybe the uh, Department of Public Safety's reaction to the, re uh, or the re resignation of the Burlington Police Sergeant uh, and that uh, entire issue of, you know, how that plays out in the, uh, in the law enforcement community as far as contracts and, and trying to recruit, you know, people that come forward and take those jobs. Well, this was a, a local issue. Um, I only know as much as you probably know at this point in time and what I've read. Um, they came to the conclusion, the, the 
city council had come to the conclusion that this was their uh, best approach forward considering uh, all of the uh, technicalities of uh, union contracts and so forth. Um, so it appears that they have a, a path forward. I'm not sure that it's going to satisfy everyone, um, but, um, but they're in a tough position. So um, from our standpoint, from my standpoint, um, it's a totally a local issue. Uh, does Mike have, or Sherlin have uh, any comment as far as, I don't know if Mike's even on the line, but um, he has to hire and recruit people. And um, again, I, I think this was an agreed upon uh, a, a contract or, or agreed upon solution uh, with uh, that particular person. So it's not as though it was forced on them. So. Uh, Secretary or uh, Commissioner Sherling, anything to add to that? Uh, no, nothing specific, Governor. I, I, as you indicated, I don't know the details uh, either, and it, it is a local matter that uh, we've not been involved in. And uh, finally, uh, on the uh, on the Supreme Court uh, death of uh, Sotomayor. Uh, Going forward, I think you said on the record that you would like to see the replacement brought forward after the elections. Um, still the case? Uh, still the case. Uh, I think that the point was made four years ago uh, that that uh, was preferable, and um, it, that's the precedent. So if we want to uh, instill confidence in our political system, uh, confidence, trust in, uh, in the government, I think we have to just follow through. and. Uh, Temper down uh, what what we're seeing uh, throughout our nation. This is uh, this is an area that uh, is going to going to further uh, divide uh, the United States, and uh, we just have to t take the first step in trying to prevent that from happening. From my standpoint, Joe, the Barton Chronicle. <laughs> I see um, in the regional forecast for the next 10 days, uh, according to Columbia University's model, that um, Orleans County is projected to see an increase in the number of cases of COVID. I am curious as to whether the tracking and tracing of the uh, group of cases we had of Oh, about a week ago suggests that's the case or if uh, the Columbia model doesn't take into account what uh, the State Department of Health already knows. Uh, I think uh, Mission Leave Levine first. <clears throat> so with this kind of a modeling uh, process, they're looking at trends in cases. And so based on the recent trend in Orleans County, they're seeing that uptick. Um, we'll see if that actually becomes true or not, because we're again dealing with very small numbers of cases in any region of the state. There is nothing new to report on the uh, interviews, contact tracing, um, um, any, anything about, you know, um, some unifying theme in Orleans County that we should be concerned about. So let's hope that the um, modeling actually uh, doesn't, doesn't show uh, uh, an increase. Commissioner Pichak's going to mention something as well. Joe, I just wanted to point out and reiterate what Dr. Levine said that um, the case counts are obviously very low and those increases projected for the Vermont counties are very low. So they're, they're projected to go up, but you know, could be a case or two could cause them to increase based on what the, the basis that they're starting from. But because they're starting from a very low number to begin with and we're dealing with very low numbers, um, I'd attribute that more to the increase than anything else. Thank you. Um, Given what uh, Dr. Levine said about um, the possible political interference in information provided by the CDC, uh, I'm curious, um, um, Governor Scott has frequently referred to 
the pandemic is a one in a hundred years event, and historically that's true, but we have no guarantee that going forward we will be as lucky as the past generations have been. Do, does the state of Vermont by itself have the public health capacity um, to deal with anything else that might come down the line in the foreseeable future? Or um, is the possible political um, interference with the CDC and perhaps the FDA something that is a matter of great concern in case of such an unfortunate eventuality? Um. I'll, I'll try and answer part of that. Uh, Commissioner Levine may want to also comment, but uh, from my standpoint, we've, we've learned a lot over the last six months since March, um, and what we've done, I think, has been beneficial, and we've been successful uh, because we've done what we thought was right, uh, and we take the guidance, we take the information that we receive, even on a federal level, and it doesn't mean that we automatically adhere to everything that they say. Uh, but we take that information in, learn from other states as well. And uh, at the end of the day, uh, we do what we think is right. And uh, it's, uh, it's again led us to where we are today. I, I did want to comment as well about the Northeast Kingdom and Orleans County uh, in particular. But I watch uh, CNN every now and then, and I get very frustrated because I see uh, there's maps uh, that they produce on a, almost a daily basis uh, showing states that are in trouble. And uh, typically, uh, th there's been many days where I see uh, Vermont as being bright red. And um, I know our case numbers. I watch them every single day. Uh, and because they deal with a percentage basis, uh, it, it appears when we go from three cases to six cases, um, it's a 100% increase. And then all of a sudden we have a doubling of the uh, number of cases. Uh, what, what most people don't understand is it literally is going from three to six. And uh, so that puts us in the red and that's frustrating. And I, I would assume that that's what some of what we're seeing uh, with some of these projections. When they look at the percentage, uh, it looks like we have a problem. But when in reality, uh, we do not. Um, Commissioner Levine. <laughs> And I can reassure the governor that at 5 o'clock this morning, CNN had us as dark green, which is as good as it gets. And there were only like three states that were a shade of green. So if we look at infectious diseases over the long term, H1N1 a decade ago, uh, Ebola and Zika less number of years ago, uh, the state of Vermont had a strategy for all of those. Um, the citizens of Vermont were protected in ways that they may not have even been aware of because they didn't have the uh, news cycle of COVID 24-7 uh, for those that we have now. Um, so uh, I'm confident Vermont can handle whatever the next issue might be. Um, I'm hopeful that whatever the next issue might be, we would have, as I've said up here many times, a coherent national strategy so states would be doing what the northern New England states are trying to do, which is talk to each other and work with one another and learn from one another, but also coordinate with one another. And that's what the country has, has needed for uh, the, the whole time of this pandemic. I don't foresee this one in a hundred year thing happening in another year or two again, but we do need to understand that the so-called concept of zoonoses, which are infectious diseases that are usually in the animal world, but then jump into the human world, uh, we are seeing that with greater frequency. So obviously, people are keeping their eye on that ball, and I don't think we would become surprised by anything, but uh, I'm not looking forward to you know a repeat of this kind of response and uh, scenario two or three years from now, I do think it'll wait quite a few years, but we shall see. Thank you very much. Wilson Ring, the AP. Um, hi, here's a question for Dr. Levine. I, I feel I should know the answer to this, but I'm a, I'm a little confused about the discussion about airborne transmission. 
I have read some of those uh, stories I've seen on it. And is there a distinction between airborne transmission and aerosolized transmission? And is it significant? I mean, I see airborne as if somebody coughs and those large droplets can spread you know, a short distance, as opposed to the, it seems, and again, this is where I'm looking for the expert guidance. The uh, discussion about the airborne transmission seems to be uh, more about the, the droplets that are the vi particles of virus that will travel further distances. There's the case of the Chinese restaurant, I think, and uh, some others that I saw. And I was just wondering if you could help me understand that better. You understand it perfectly well. Uh, and just to repeat for the public at large, Yes, the, the, the concept was the more fine mists that are aerosols as opposed to the large respiratory droplets. Indeed, proportion-wise, I, I would still believe the large respiratory droplets are the inherent danger with this virus, and that's why staying further than six feet from people is uh, a good idea and wearing a mask. But the uh, fine aerosols uh, the Chinese restaurant study, a whole host of both uh, physical chemistry studies and epidemiologic studies provide a fair amount of evidence that aerosols still may play a significant role, just not maybe as high a proportion as the uh, large respiratory droplets. And knowing that has implications, of course, for how we protect ourselves from those aerosols, um, because we can't necessarily distance ourselves from them. Masks are believed to have uh, really a two-way street where we always think of them as an altruistic thing where we're protecting our neighbor from them, from, the, from our droplets. But there's some evidence that perhaps with the aerosols, you may be protecting yourself by wearing the mask as well. And then that has implications, of course, for ventilation systems and filtration of air as well. So you're right on target. So, so then using the term airborne, in this context is focusing more on the aerosolized. I mean, is that correct? Is yeah, that, that, and, and, that, and, that, and that was the intent, to, to, broaden, to broaden the um, landscape a little bit beyond large droplets. OK, that answers my question perfectly. Thank you very much. Stuart, NBC5. Mike, the Islander. Thanks, <clears throat> Thanks Rebecca. Uh, Governor, uh, UN Secretary French are right this morning that Vermonters are frustrated with COVID-19 restrictions, but by all accounts, you and Vermont have done the best effort of all 50 states. Still remains frustrating though for Vermonters. And uh, Vermonters are shared the pain and the state has worked with just about every group, but one group we keep hearing from it says they've been ignored are the landlords. They say they understand the importance of providing good shelters to families, but they're also reporting that they aren't getting any income. A lot of people are not paying their rent. So the landlords are in a catch-22. They aren't getting paid and they can't evict the tenants. They say they need help paying their taxes, paying bills, paying their employees, paying contractors make sure that there's actually heat lights in the roof or in good working shape for these tenants. And one landlord reports being owed $23,000 and another is owed $17,000 with no place to turn. Does the state have any significant plan to help or work with these landlords uh, that are frustrated by what they're in the middle of? Having owned a, I've been a landlord at one point in my, my life, I understand the frustration and uh, the tight margins there. Um, we do have a program, um, and I would maybe, maybe Secretary Curley uh, might be able to describe that, uh, but we have a program in place um, that uh, with the CARES money uh, that we are reimbursing for those who uh, haven't been able to pay uh, to make sure that landlords are protected. Uh, Secretary Curley, anything to offer on that? Sure. 
Governor. Um, yes, we through the CARES Act, we are able to offer some support and assistance through the Rental Housing Stabilization uh, Stabilization Program. Um, it's being administered by the Vermont State Housing Authority in partnership with the Department of Housing and Community Development. So if uh, you want to either go to our website, get a little more information on that, there is uh, some information there. But I'm also happy to connect you with, uh, with uh, Commissioner Hanford, who can, can walk you through the, the variety of options that would be available to, um, again, to help support these, these landlords. Yeah, Mike. So, so that money is going through, the money is going to the landlords, it's not going to necessarily the tenants who are then under an obligation, hopefully, to pay the, that money to the landlords, you're saying? Yeah, the money goes directly to the landlords. And um, in some instances, the, I think the ideal is that the landlord and the, and the tenant are both um, attesting to the situation. Um, and obviously, there's, I think, a, an alternate if, if the tenant or the, yeah, the tenant's not willing to um, work at, together with the landlord to, to show the, the need. So, um, yeah, the, the money does not go to the tenant with the expectation that they will be responsible to pay the landlord. It, it will go directly to the landlord. Great. And, Mike, if you, if you have a specific uh, landlord uh, that has been impacted, uh, please have them contact us or you can, and we'll put them in touch with Commissioner Hanford uh, for a description of that or someone there so that we make sure that we provide whatever relief we can. Great. I'll get back to the ones that, that reached out to us. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and I believe Stuart Ledbetter is on the line now. Yeah, thanks, Rebecca. Uh, a question about the BPR PBS poll out today, which Governor shows you with a big lead over David Zuckerman in a competitive race for uh, Lieutenant Governor. What's your, what's your read on these results and how much difference do you think it would really make to have Scott Milne in the number two spot, um, you know, should you win another term? Um, well, a couple uh, a couple things. In terms of the poll itself, I, while they provide some information, it's a snapshot in time. Uh, politics is fickle, as you know. You've covered it for a long time. Um, and, uh, and while you might be the hero this week, uh, you might be the villain next week, and uh, perception changes. So uh, again, it's uh, good information to have and uh, good for your ego, but, uh, but at the same time, um, you have to focus on what you're doing, doing it for the right reasons, not following polls. And that's what I've done throughout my political life and I'll continue to do now uh, in terms of uh, uh, having um, Scott Milne in the second position. That would be beneficial to me, um, just having someone with the same uh, thought and and uh, and the same goals uh, that I have in terms of uh, economic recovery. Uh, he's uh, he's someone that uh, I believe has lived this uh, in his own businesses over a number of years. So it would be helpful for me. The poll also found that on the question of a regulated retail marijuana system, uh, I think every group, every region voters of every party favor this idea? Does that factor into the decision you're going to have to make? You know, what, what factored into my decision, or what factors into my decision, is uh, some of what I outlined. Uh, as you know, over the last couple of years, I've had some concerns about going to a regulated market. And so I narrowed it to three issues. Uh, and that would they would have to satisfy uh, those issues in, in order for me to move forward. It appears uh, that they've come a long ways, and they've really tried uh, to meet my concerns. And I uh, I appreciate that uh, from the legislature. And again, I made this this uh, um, uh, when I when I talked about this the other day, um, I was uh, comparing that to the Global Warming Solutions Act, where they didn't. Uh, address my concerns. In fact, they didn't even try to, um, which is in stark contrast uh, to this, uh, to the uh, the tax and regulate of uh, marijuana that we've seen. So, again, I appreciate that. We'll take a look at that. Uh, it, that will determine uh, when I go through the bill, uh, determine whether I allow it to move forward or not. 
Thank you, Governor. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, Europe is reportedly experiencing a second wave of the virus. Uh, what's being done in Vermont to protect against the second wave here? Um, I'll uh, refer to Dr. Levine, but I, but I can say um, from my standpoint, uh, continuing to do what we're doing. Um, and it's really about those simple measures, paying attention uh, to the, uh, the, the guidance that we've put out, uh, simple principles, uh, just trying to be careful uh, and, uh, and uh, do as much testing as we possibly can uh, so that we have a, a surveillance of what's going on in Vermont and uh, not opening that economic spigot too fast as we have done uh, throughout uh, this the last six months. We just open it a small amount at a time. And if we continue to do that uh, and not to try and open it too quick, uh, I, think, uh, I think we'll still be successful. But again, watching the other uh, states around us is important as well uh, because they do have an impact on us, and I, I watch the information every day. I know our health department does, and our epi team, uh, as well as uh, Commissioner Pichek with his modeling. It gives us a sense of what's going on around the country, but in particular in the Northeast, uh, to see what's coming at us. And when, when we saw at one point uh, that it appeared to be moving, it was moving up the East Coast, uh, impacting uh, Maryland and and other states uh, up the line, Connecticut and so forth, where they saw a bit of a resurgence, uh, that's when uh, we wanted to uh, put into effect our mass mandate and uh, to try and stop uh, the transmission coming into Vermont if it get, got here uh, to make sure uh, that we didn't have any increases in positive cases. It appears the measures we took were successful and that's what we have to do, be nimble, watch the information keep track of the science and the data, and follow those really four simple principles of you know, just making sure that when we're, when we're sick, to stay away from others, keeping phys physically separated, wearing a mask, uh, and washing your hands a lot. If we continue to do that, I think we'll be okay. Dr. Levine. The concept of a second wave itself needs to be explained. Um, clearly, in the United States, if we have what's called a second wave, it really won't be a second wave. It's really going to be a continuation of what's been going on since the beginning of the year. Dr. Kelso and I had a chance to look at some World Health Organization data yesterday and uh, mapping of cases. And when you really look at that, we never got down to zero anywhere in the world, really. Most places got down a certain amount from their first initial experience with the virus. They put the mitigation strategies in place, things came down, and we see them on the rise again. But that's really a continuation of what began in February, March, April, as opposed to something new. The difference in the United States, you know, if, if the curve around the world kind of looks like things went up, they came down, and now they're going back up. The United States went up, it came down to a much higher level, not as low as a lot of places that have done a better job. And um, that's really, for our country, just a continuation of what's happened. I will say, if you look at the Vermont curve, I mean, we really have come down. Um, <clears throat> and the virus has really been suppressed to a much lower level. I can't add much more to what the governor said about how we're protecting Vermonters because um, the strategy is, is the strategy. It's not really being adapted to something new coming down the pike right now. It continues to be the same strategy. And really, we need to take Dr. Fauci's advice and make sure that we do not let our guard down because that would really be at odds with the current strategy that we're doing. So keeping the adherence that we're doing. And I think, you know, we've, we've done a really good job in the state of protecting those most vulnerable. And we need to continue that uh, because that indeed is the most fragile part of any part of managing this pandemic is worrying about those who are living in congregate settings, worrying about those who may have 
a special vulnerability to the virus because of their age or their medical conditions, etc. So we need to continue to pay attention to that as well. But I think what the governor said about travel is very, very um, wise. We need to, um, again, try to make sure we can encourage travel to the degree we can, but watch it very closely because we know that zones change very quickly sometimes and where we think uh, we're comfortable having people from Vermont go and come back to or people come into the state as tourists, um, one week it may look very good, another week or another month it may not. And we need to clearly watch the trends uh, just to be ahead of that game. Thank you. Pat, the BCAS? Hi, this question is likely for Dr. Levine. We hear a lot of comments like, well, things won't go back to normal until there's a vaccine. And I think some people view it as kind of like a flick of the switch, like there's gonna be a vaccine and then suddenly things will go back to what they were pre-COVID. But I think in reality, we all know it's gonna be a longer process than that. Can you talk about what the vaccine rollout timeline might look like here once one has been approved and what people should expect when they hear a vaccine has been approved and are wondering you know, when they might be able to go back to quote unquote normal? This, you know, this is a great question this morning because um, unless you watch for subtleties, there's been a subtle change in messaging. Even though we know there is uh, a lot of politicization being done about a vaccine will be ready by election day, et cetera. If we ignore that, even in Washington, and from people we respect in the healthcare enterprise in Washington, there's been a subtle change in the messaging. And the messaging now is the vaccine may indeed be here by the year's end, but that's only for a very small percentage of the US population. It needs to be really geared up in terms of production and manufacturing. It'll be the first half of next year before a lot more of us might get to see it. And it'll certainly play out over the whole course of next year. But the subtlety in the messaging is the lifestyle we're becoming accustomed to today and all of the things we're doing today actually will continue on even when a vaccine arrives because it's a two-pronged strategy. It's doing all the things we can to suppress the virus and the way we live, but it's also having a vaccine increase the numbers of us who might have a form of immunity to the virus. And just by being immune will help suppress the virus level in the population as well. But that number isn't gonna grow to high proportions as quickly as a vaccine might become available. So, that's sort of the messaging that we, we are now hearing and, and I actually subscribe to because it makes a lot of sense. Knowing again that the herd immunity that so many are looking for just isn't happening. You know, if a state has got 10% of its people uh, with antibodies to the virus before a vaccine, that's a lot. Uh, most, most of the states like ours are gonna be much less than that. Um, so, you know, and again, the timeline, I, you know, I, I don't want to be the holder of the crystal ball by any means, but the timeline is, I think, kind of the way it was described in the conference that Dr. Fauci came to. You know, this fall, we may indeed see one or two of these vaccine candidates um, achieve some kind of uh, approval uh, because of their efficacy and safety, um, but they'll again be available to a high priority part of the population. And that, will, that is being determined real, literally as we speak by the uh, AICP, which is the advisory panel on immunizations that uh, the CDC has. And um, it'll be early to mid next year before there's enough gearing up of the manufacturing and ability to administer this to a bigger chunk of the population. Um, before that happens. Did I cover all the things you asked? I think you did, yes. Yeah. Thanks. All right, Jolie, Local 22. Hi, um, as we enter the colder months, uh, does Vermont have enough flu vaccines 
or um, are there uh, expected to be some shortages across the state? Dr. Levine. Today, the answer is no, but that's in a typical year as well. But uh, certainly over the next one to two months, um, we've already got our earlier shipments of vaccine in. And in fact, if you uh, take an informal survey of your own, you'll find a lot of people have actually been able to access the vaccine at this point. Uh, but this is going to really gear up um, as we get through October. And um, everything is sort of already ordered. We have a percentage higher than previous years ordered, knowing that there may be increased demand this year. We have had uh, favorable work, not just in our Vaccine for Children program, but in our Vaccine for Adult program, which includes adults now over 65 who are in the Medicare uh, age range, uh, because that program is now uh, allowing vaccines for that group as well. We've had a tremendous uh, rollout and continuing collaborative work with multiple sectors of the healthcare system uh, in terms of creative and innovative ways to deliver this vaccine. And so Vermonters can access it without uh, hopefully a lot of tedious chores. Um, so yes, they could access it in the usual places, like their doctor's office. They could access it in places that haven't been as usual, but can become more usual, like pharmacies. But there's a lot of partnership going on with our local health offices and the Department of Health uh, with practices across the state, whether they be part of a health network, whether they be part of a federally qualified health center. Uh, to deliver the vaccine in novel locations, like outside of school, uh, outside a uh, supermarket, places like that where um, you can actually receive the vaccine uh, this year where you may not have in previous years. So we're going to see more and more of that work evolve over the next couple of weeks. And you'll see a lot more um, mes messaging from the health department um, regarding uh, all those sort of accessible points. And then um, I just wanted to follow up um, and clarify um, the uh, on the topic of transmission and CDC abruptly pulling the guidance off their website. Um, if the virus can spread through airborne particles, why exactly did they take that guidance off their website? Probably not a question for me or any of us up here. Um, the, the statement they made was that uh, it had been put up too early and it hadn't been appropriately checked and it would be put up again when they had gone through their process. But obviously, already pundits far with far more stat stature than myself are saying that this seems to be more of a political message. I don't have any verification of that, so we can only think what we think. Um, it's unfortunate when it builds on several other instances that have occurred in the last several weeks that we've commented on up here, um, and that eventually have gone the right way. Thank you. Aaron, VT Digger. My question is about the turn of the spigot that was allowed last week, the increase in hotel capacity, because um, some hotel and hospitality leaders and owners wrote to us to say, this doesn't really make a difference to us because we've been as a lower occupancy anyway, but well below the legal occupancy because so many people are limited uh, or banned from coming to Vermont. Um, you know, I, I'm sure that many of them also feel that they don't want to put their employees and their safety at greater risk, but they're quite in quite a bind right now uh, with people unable to come into the state. What do you have to say to people in hospitality who are um, 
still struggling because of the restrictions? Well, first of all, I, I don't recall hearing from anyone in the lodging industry that asked us not to expand uh, the occupancy rate of their facilities, zero. But maybe that's true. And if they have concerns about that, obviously they don't have to. Uh, they're in control of their own occupancy. If they don't want to uh, have 100%, they don't have to. Um, I have uh, a great concern uh, for the hospitality sector, uh, as you probably know. Um, that's why we put forth um, a fairly significant economic package uh, to be considered by the legislature uh, to address uh, some needs, uh, to try and give them enough money, enough grants to survive so they can thrive in the future. Uh, without that money, I, I think they are in trouble. And so, again, uh, the legislature didn't, uh, didn't move forward with everything we've asked, uh, but, uh, but we still have that opportunity and we're still going to continue to work on that because if there's one sector uh, that suffered more, uh, the most, it's the hospitality sector, lodging, restaurants. So we, um, we're going to continue to do everything we can to help, but I, we haven't banned anybody from coming into Vermont, just to be absolutely clear. Um, they can still come to Vermont, uh, but they have to quarantine if they do. Um, and if they come from those areas that we model, that we just finished modeling today, uh, that are green counties that are safe, they can come to Vermont without, uh, without having to quarantine. We're talking about millions of people who can come to Vermont right now without quarantine. Um, and uh, from, again, from my standpoint, we're trying to balance um, public safety uh, with their, uh, the economy. And that's why we've done a little bit at a time. I think opening up uh, lodging to 100% uh, made a lot of sense. Uh, the, uh, we, and it was based on the advice and consent of our epi team uh, and Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, and thought that this was an approach that was safe. Uh, so that's why we, we continue to do so. With uh, the economic disadvantage they're, uh, they're uh, living uh, with that in mind. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a, a question about the recently announced school case at uh, Williamstown, I believe it is. It's not reported on the Department of Health's new uh, for, report of school cases, which, which says that it um, was last updated September 18th. Is that going to be updated on a weekly basis or? What is, what is the time period for us finding out about school cases? Uh, Secretary Smith. I'll have Dr. Levine uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the health department will update that on a weekly basis. I think it's going to be updated every Monday, if I'm correct. Um, it, the cutoff will be a Friday, and then it will be updated uh, every Monday. So it, it, it um, I don't believe that case would be updated until um, uh, next yes, week. We just switched Tuesday. Uh, it, yeah, we just switched. So um, I'll look into it, Aaron. But uh, it, obviously, everybody knows because we have announced that there was a case in Williamstown. But we'll update the website to uh, to correspond yeah. to that. Okay. Thank you very much. Mike, True North reports. Hi, uh, thanks for taking my question. Um, about the masks and sports, so the current Vermont policy since September 8th is that children must wear masks even while we're playing sports. Um, the current CDC guidelines for wearing a mask during sports are that during high intensity sports, players may not be able to wear a mask because they are, because they say wearing them causes difficulty breathing. So my question is, why isn't Vermont following the CDC guidelines on this? Yeah, we've, uh, we've been more restrictive on it in a number of areas from the CDC and we'll continue to do what we think is right for Vermont. Um, but, um, but again, we, um, we, just, we just thought this was the right approach, whether, you know, we had decisions to make as to whether we should have sports at all. Um, the first priority is getting kids back in school, getting back into some in-person instruction. 
uh, which we thought was safe. Uh, secondary to that was uh, was sports, uh, and felt that having this uh, uh, mass uh, to prevent uh, the spread, because the spread uh, of the virus can happen uh, to kids uh, and as well as adults. And so uh, we just thought this was the right approach. Um, are you and your expert continuing to monitor studies on the mask wearing that show both the benefits and potential harms that they uh, cause? Um, we'll continue to monitor every situation as it as it relates to the health of uh, Vermonters. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Guy Page. Good morning, Governor. Good morning. What is the status of students taking driver's ed in school and taking road tests for their licenses? That I, I don't know, a Guy. Um, I don't know if Secretary French can offer anything about the uh, driver's education. Uh, I can speak to Okay. Yeah, hi, Guy. Um, I haven't heard of any further issues. I know, um, you know, Driver's Ed has certainly expanded the access uh, for testing and so forth. I know I, I, my daughter took her test in August, and we didn't really have a lot of trouble scheduling that. Um, but I think initially, uh, particularly in the earlier part of the summer, there were concerns about, you know, the safety of, of running, running those programs and so forth. But I think a lot of the programs have come back online. I haven't heard more from schools uh, about a backlog in that issue. So driver's ed, uh, the necessary hours with the, with, the, with the teacher and everything, that's going forward and, and if someone with a learner's permit can go into DMV and take a test, just sort of the way we're all used to? Yeah, I'm not sure so much about the DMV uh, mechanics, but I will say in schools, I believe the programs are certainly, they have a backlog, but they're addressing the issue as the schools have reopened. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Guy, um, on, on that issue with motor vehicle, I, I don't believe we have a backlog there, but be happy to take a look uh, and uh, inquire of uh, Commissioner Manoli uh, to find out where we're at. But, uh, but I think we caught up, and I believe you can make an appointment just as we normally have, but you have to make the appointment and reserve the slot. But let me check on that and uh, make sure I'm correct. Thank you. Um, last week, Seattle350.org leaders taught Vermonters mass protest techniques like coping with police crowd control chemicals, how to stay safe and healthy in jail. Um, has your administration spoken with Vermont's organized protest community, trying to set ground rules for a peaceful protest, especially around election time? Um, Commissioner Sherling, uh, maybe I'd refer to you. I, I'm not aware of any any protest plan, but uh, but that doesn't mean there aren't any. And I'm not sure if we've engaged with those potential protesters or not. Yeah, that's correct, Governor. Um, I'm not aware of any scheduled protests that are in our service areas uh, at this point, but when they do crop up, we do actively uh, work to engage organizers to ensure that uh, things go smoothly and safely and everyone uh, can exercise uh, their rights without uh, without running into any risk. Yeah, peace, peaceful protests are, are, you know, what we want to underscore, uh, that uh, as long as we want to give individuals the right uh, to, uh, to use, uh, utilize their freedom of speech, and, uh, but to do it in a safe manner. I think that's the point, and we'll continue to, to if we hear about uh, an organized protest, we'll engage in trying to make sure that everyone stays safe. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. Hello, just hoping Secretary Smith might be able to just give us an update on child care hubs. Child care hubs. Thanks, Avery. Just uh, reporting as of this morning, um, 
we are proud to report there are 31 school-aged child care hubs uh, that have been identified and will provide child care at 83 different locations with 76 of those locations currently up and running. In aggregate, the hubs are anticipating to serve approximately 4,800 children with many of those children attending more than one week. Uh, in terms of capacity, the sites currently available can offer over 10,000 slots uh, for children. As I've mentioned several times, it's important to keep in mind that one child can uh, occupy multiple slots over the course of the week and that multiple children can occupy one slot over the course of a week. Um, we're still looking uh, to expand this, but I, I've just got to say this. I mean, the DCF and the after school program have done remarkable work um, getting this program up and running in such a short amount of time. And we'll, it's a dynamic program, so we'll adjust as, as the needs sort of uh, warrant here in, in the state. As soon as, uh, uh, as soon as schools come back full time in person, we'll have to adjust there. If there continues to be remote or uh, learning, we'll adjust as well there. But this has been a remarkable effort in an, um, an amazing short of time to get uh, this system up and running. Thank you. Peter, VPR. Commissioner Levine, um, you talked recently about uh, other folks having concerns about politi politicization at the CDC. Um, are you personally of the belief that politics is playing an undue role in the formation of guidance or other policy there? Um, and, and Separately, have you uh, registered your concern specifically about the removal of the airborne guidance from uh, the most recent uh, CDC guidance? Yeah, so make no mistake, I still think the CDC is one of the preeminent uh, health and public health directed organizations in the world, highly respected. I think it's actually a, a shame that it's been called out the way it's been called out, but this is the reality that we are seeing in front of us. Um, I would use the word, it's great science and it's great scientists and its ability to disseminate credible information that is very factual and science-based and data-driven is being interfered with, but it's not being um, totally uh, destroyed by any means. Um, so most of the time what we're finding is perhaps a delay as opposed to the actual information never seeing the light of day. Um, the, the most egregious example was what happened with uh, testing of asymptomatic people. Um, we stood up in Vermont and said we are going to continue to test asymptomatic people who may have come in contact with someone who is COVID positive. The CDC eventually uh, returned to that and published that on its website. CDC also um, had this most recent uh, episode. I uh, have not registered anything as it literally has happened overnight. Uh, so I haven't had a chance to uh, do anything about that. As part of the organization of state health officials, um, we uh, all in a consensus fashion um, sent some communication to uh, a number of the organizations we deal with the most often, including CDC and HHS, and indeed uh, then had a direct conversation as an organization with um, the Secretary for uh, Health, uh, Brett Giroir, Admiral Giroir, uh, which was quite productive. So we have registered, you know, um, not just Little Vermont, but as a nation, uh, our concern mostly, um, as well as somewhat of our dismay regarding what's happened uh, in recent weeks. 
Um, unfortunately, this is yet another example, but this too will come to pass. And like I said, the right information is always coming out. It just might not be coming out in the timely fashion that had been planned. Uh, while I have you, Commissioner Green, um, is you investigating any uh, possible clusters or outbreaks in Memorial County right now? What county? Lamoille. Lamoille. Oh, Lamoille County. Um, several weeks ago, but nothing recent. Um, okay. So I, 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 you're probably looking at where the cases are coming from on a daily basis. Um, but well, we have heard, heard from some locals there about the possibility of some cases related to a large gathering recently. Yeah, and if that's true, I'm not aware of uh, the specific and gathering that we've linked cases to. Okay, thank you very much. And the Newport Daily Express. And yeah, good afternoon. Uh, this would probably be for uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, the other day when I was driving to a meeting, I uh, stopped up on a uh, hill that's got great scenic views, and I took some pictures. The point of the pictures wasn't to take pictures of fall foliage. Um, it was pictures of hazy skies in the middle of the afternoon, which leads me to believe that this is ash that's coming uh, from the wildfires out west. Have you had any feedback at this point of whether or not that type of air pollution is affecting Vermont? What type of impact do you think that could have uh, during this pandemic? And is there any advice that the Department of Health is offering to make sure that people are safe when they see this type of a fallout? Yeah, I may refer to, uh, first of all, Secretary Moore. Uh, she's on the line because I sure. believe um, you had reported this. Uh, yesterday or the day before uh, that some of the, the haze we're seeing is from uh, the remnants of the uh, the fires and in, in the smoke from the West Coast. Right. Yes. Yes, Governor. That, we are seeing the smoke from, from the fires in the West Coast. Um, and that we, we know that it is actually affecting uh, view sheds and, and what folks are able to see. The sky itself may be tinged with orange or other colors. Um, and the smoke is not expected to really reach ground level to any significant extent. Um, we are measuring fine particulate matter. We refer to it as PM 2.5. Um, but really are expecting concentrations to remain in the, in the good or, or worst case scenario, the moderate or severe quality index um, through the next several days. I think you have agreement there in the, in the household. Um, Anything you want to? I do. I apologize. <laughs> is, there, is there any guidelines the Department of Health has uh, to make sure that people who are vulnerable or are elderly with asthma, or some type of medical condition, that they'll be safe when they go outside? I mean, is there a recommendation to wear a mask all the time, or, um, or with a mask as a fact? We, we maintain a, a website that uh, tracks the air quality index and uh, writ large. Uh, not just for this incident, but, but other air quality concerns. And if you're interested, I can follow up afterwards through Rebecca um, and provide you a link to that website, which, which shows you we're tracking air quality. Yeah, I'd like to see that. That would be great. Okay. okay. I'll I'll follow up. Up. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Andrew, Caledonian Record. Yes, good afternoon. Um, I suppose this might be for Secretary French. Uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier the work on cells and winter sports guidance, um, and I know it's not slated to be released uh, for a few more weeks yet, but is there uh, still a question of if indoor winter sports can happen, or has that issue been settled and now it's more about uh, determining how best to allow it? Very French. Yeah, I think you know we're uh, we're following the same process we did with the fall, and uh, I invite Secretary Moore to chime in. But um, as I mentioned, it's, it involves a lot of the key stakeholders, and not the least of which are our medical experts, including Dr. Raskin and Dr. Lee. Um, but we also have folks that are familiar with athletics in general in the state, VPA, and so forth. But also involves athletic directors and those that are specific uh, 
experts on the specific sports that are involved. So we'll consider all those elements as the guidance comes together. Okay. So uh, no determination yet um, that they can have. Um, yeah, we haven't finalized uh, our approach to this yet, but in October we'll definitely do so. All right, thanks. Steve, NEK TV. Hello, can you hear me? We can. Um, great. Uh, this one's for Dr. Levine. Um, there's a noted Chinese virologist. Um, her uh, work's been published and uh, peer reviewed in Science, Nature, and The Lancet, I believe. Uh, her name is Dr. Li Ming Yang. And um, she's come forward recently, I guess she was spirited out of communist China. Um, she's come forward recently and said that this, uh, that the virus was assembled um, or put together in, in a lab and she can identify the cut sites. Um, uh, do you have any, uh, any opinion? Have you seen any of the, her work, Dr. Levine? I've not seen work, uh, her work related to this particular topic. Um, it has been a pretty common theme for several months um, that this was a virus manufactured in a lab that uh, either unintentionally or intentionally and it got out. Um, as part of researching that, the World Health Organization was able to send some scientists into China to further investigate. Um, we've had people in the U.S. government who have also uh, been in touch with that team and may even have a member of uh, the U.S. scientific establishment uh, on that team. I've not heard anything that would corroborate the fact that this virus um, came from a laboratory and didn't come from animal to human transmission. Um, but again, it's probably still in process, so I really can't say anything more definitive because that's all, that's as much as I know, and I think that's as much information as has been released. Yeah, she just came forward last week. Um, thank you. Um, and regarding the, uh, cell phone, uh, the cell phone, uh, tracking data, uh, I was kind of intrigued when you mentioned last week that it was, uh, it was voluntary. Um, is this something that uh, that like people entering Vermont are are asked if it's okay to be tracked, or is this like part of a 24-page, you know, legally thing that people just hit okay when they, you know, uh, when they first get their phone? So the, so that the public understands what you're saying, uh, the cell phone tracking is referring to understanding social mobility patterns of the population uh, by using uh, the geospatial guidance of their cell phone as opposed to part of contact tracing or anything else like that. Since it was Commissioner Pichak's uh, slide that you're referring to with that data, I'll invite him up and he can answer further. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that question, Steve. So just to reiterate, the data is data that's, that's accumulated by a third-party provider. Um, they anonymize it, they aggregate it, so we don't know who it is. We can't even really know specifically where it's coming from. It's sort of in an aggregated census block. And it's user-consented, meaning when you, generally when you download an app, they'll call out specifically, can this app track you? You know, when you have it open, can it track you at all times? And you usually say yes or no to that. So that is um, the user consented piece. It is called out specifically, uh, generally, for the apps that I've seen. Um, and it's nothing to do with Vermont. It's tracking people across the globe. Sure, but they are specifically asked uh, that they, it's okay for them to be tracked. Yeah, that's been, you know, usually the question is, can we share your mobility with, you know, Apple or whomever the app might be with? And that's been my experience with every, every app that I've seen. Okay, great. Um, thank you all very much.
Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. You talked uh, about indoor hospitality, and I think the third branch talked about sports, and they both come together uh, in upcoming ski season. And there's, as you know, there's no place more crowded than uh, a ski lodge. Are you kind of thinking along the same lines as Secretary French on uh, when to uh, perhaps turn the spigot again for uh, indoor hospitality, which would be so important this winter? Uh, you know, October, I think, is what Secretary French was yeah, well, again, I think we're going to rely on the data and science. Uh, we haven't uh, contemplated that uh, turn of the spigot at this point in time, but uh, knowing, you know, with the ski season coming up, uh, typically um, after the first of the year, uh, we do have some time uh, to put that together. But, um, but again, if, we, uh, if we're able to, and I know the ski areas themselves are, are putting some guidelines into place uh, to make sure that they keep uh, their guests safe, uh, and which is uh, applauded by uh, our this administration. And uh, we'll work with them uh, to make sure that we do all we can uh, so that they can continue to have their guests coming to Vermont, uh, but do it in a safe manner. So I, I don't think we're ready uh, to make a decision at, at this point on that uh, on that front. And there's no, I know during the summer you, there was some restrictions on recreational sports, but there's nothing that that wouldn't allow the, uh, the ski area to uh, yeah. implement Yeah, no, as, as far as I know at this point in time, again, we haven't really t spoken about this in great detail, um, but if they adhere to the guidelines that are in, the, in place at this point in time, they could open tomorrow if there was snow. So um, we'll, uh, we'll continue to work with them and making sure that Vermonters are safe, kept safe, uh, and that we're able to open up the economy as much as we can. Uh, but, uh, but again, we have to be, use some common sense and be practical about this. We'll follow the uh, data and the science and, uh, and take the advice of the health experts before we open that, uh, open that door. All right, great, thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. To follow up on that last question, will there be any specific guidance issued for Vermont ski resorts in terms of on-slope capacity, chairlift uh, density, and lining up to board chairlift? You know, again, we haven't, uh, I know that they, the skiers themselves, are working on that. Um, we will work with them in any way we can uh, to provide any help we can, uh, but, um, but we just haven't gotten that far at this point in time. Um, but, uh, but I would imagine, uh, again, if we can uh, adhere to the guidelines we have in place right now, uh, keeping the six-foot separation, wearing a mask, and so forth and so on, uh, I, th I th believe uh, they could open at this point. Uh, there's uh, the, the mass gathering I think that you're referring to uh, may, not, uh, may not work the same way because they are uh, so separated. But we'll, uh, we'll be working on that over the next, uh, over the next month or so. Thank you. And we received a question from a reader. This is probably a question for Commissioner Smith, wanting to know why schools can't create child care, distance, or remote learning pods within the school system. Why they can't exist in a staff space within the school? Is there a legal reason why pods can't be in schools? I wasn't aware that they couldn't. But um, Secretary Smith, do you have anything, or do you want to get back to Lisa? Yeah, Lisa, I wasn't aware that they couldn't. In fact, we do have some, we're using some school facilities right now for our child care uh, locations. So um, I, I would be more than happy to meet with uh, anybody that wants some further clarification. Great, I will pass this information back to the reader. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Pam Davis. Uh, this is a question uh, for both uh, uh, either just the governor or for uh, Dr. Levine. Uh, the, uh, the state of Vermont has done extremely well with uh, managing the COVID, and I think everybody recognizes that. And one of the reasons for that is that the is what we're seeing right here in these press conferences, where we get a steady supply of, of really reliable information that you can count on dealing with that issue. 
And the equally important and much more complicated issue, I think, is health care reform and the, and the supply of, of, uh, of reliable information there is very much less available. But my question basically is this. This is the first question is for the governor. One of the questions that has that is very much alive in the reform space now is whether One Care Vermont has how, what its performance has been, and specifically whether it has saved any money. In the last, uh, the the uh, recent press reports say that the that, we, uh, that uh, One Care Vermont has not saved any money during the period of reform, which is which has run from 2013 to the current day. My question is this: I understand that this is kind of from left field, and I don't expect you to have specific numbers. But do you think that you, do you think could you assess and tell us your opinion about what how much value we have achieved from healthcare reform in Vermont over the last the time from 2013 until now? Yeah, yeah, Ham, uh, good question. Uh, you know, we've made some gains, uh, but uh, but obviously with some of uh, what. Uh, the federal government has uh, has told us that we're not meeting uh, some of the targets uh, that we are, are supposed to. Um, so we have some work to do. I think, as uh, Secretary Smith had mentioned, maybe last week, uh, that uh, we need a bit of a reboot. We need to uh, to take a look and see whether One Care is doing all they can, and it's uh, and it's still um, there's areas of improvement that we can make within One Care, or what we need to do uh, to to bring um, affordable health care back on track and uh, to the forefront. So uh, we look forward to that. I know Secretary Smith is, uh, is engaging as we speak uh, and we'll, uh, we'll continue to try and improve because we know uh, that issue didn't go away. It's still here. Uh, thank you, Governor. But let me, just, let me just leave you with one question that I don't expect to answer today, but that is this. Perfect. The, uh, the press coverage says that there was that reform has that the one care Vermont has not saved any money. My calculations, comparing the performance of the hospital Vermont hospital system in the first decade of the new millennium to the period of reform, shows that the healthcare that the hospital system costs were reduced by a total of almost two billion dollars over that period. So my question is, I understand that you're not running around with numbers like that at the tip of your tongue, but I would ask you for the next time, what do you, is the, that's a specific number, that's a fact. It's not a, you know, well, we need to boot up a little bit or we need to diddle around with this or we need to do a little better. The reality is in order to get at these issues, you have to, we have to start getting hired information. My question to you would be for the future, what do your numbers show? What we say, I get 1.95 billion from 2013 to 2019. What do you get? Yeah. Um, um, if I can get one, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead and ask your next question. I'm going to ask uh, Secretary Smith to comment because I've asked him uh, the same they, questions. <laughs> okay. The, uh, the sec my second question is, and once, once again, this is a little bit unfair because it's just coming out of left field, but one of the, one of the things that seems to me that we need in the health care reform field, as I say, is hard, reliable that the public, the whole public, and have confidence in, and one of the major sources of that, uh, both for Vermont and, at a, and, and in comparison to national, okay, is what we've gotten from Dr. Levine on medical questions. So this, the whole reform space, if you will, is replete with really difficult medical questions on which people absolutely do not agree. So here's just the kind of question that I think arises, and I would like him Dr. Levine to consider. One of the issues that has come up in the last two months is whether the whether the Northwest Medical Center in St. Albans should build from basically from scratch and a, a, a new ICU, okay, on the, the, the uh, uh, an ICU in conjunction with telemedicine to Dartmouth, okay, on the assumption that they cannot get in the cannot get adequate purpose from the ICU that is 30 minutes down the road at UVM. So my question is, uh, I, as I say, probably can't be answered right off the top, but what Dr. Levine, I'd like to know whether Dr. Levine, Dr. Levine would weigh in on a question like that. Secretary Smith um, offer his uh, words of advice. 
Hey, Adam, thank you for the questions. I think, you know, I don't want to dismiss what I said last week when I used the word reboot like you happened uh, to do just a little while ago, because I think we have to look at everything, including the cost savings that we, we, we talk about. There, there are numbers flying around in terms of what, is, what are the accurate cost savings, and, and I think we need to look in terms of uh, those cost savings. In terms of Northwest, I mean, you've, you've got to admit that part of the uh, issue with Northwest is that's a Green Mountain Care Board function, is to look at whether they should be uh, applying the various services that they're applying because it's budget related. And of course, the Green Mountain Care Board does uh, approve their budget. But I, don't, I want to get back to the issue of looking at health care because I think it's important. I think we're at a critical stage right now where we really have to take a close look at a, at a correction, at a mid-course correction during the all-payer model. And I want to distinguish between the all-payer model because it's all-encompassing and the ACO, which is part of the all-payer model. The all-payer model, and I said this last week, and I really, I truly believe this, the all-payer model theoretically has some very, very innovative and progressive elements to it. And in fact, I've seen it work um, in a way that really stabilized the healthcare system during the height of the pandemic. So how do we make that theoretical aspect of the all-payer work on a better operational uh, aspect, I think is important as we move forward. And I, I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't dismiss that everything is going okay. Uh, I think we've got to admit that operationally, we've got a lot of work ahead of us in order to make the theoretical match up with the operational. And I think that's, that's important as we move forward. So I do thank you for the question. I'll be ready for the, uh, some of the specifics that you had mentioned when we uh, come back Friday. Uh, uh, thank you for that, uh, Secretary Smith. I, I totally agree with you about the Green Mountain Care Board. It's interesting, I asked that question in the Green Mountain, when the Green Mountain Care Board handled the, uh, made their recent decision on the Northwest budget. They really didn't make a call on that, and I think they should have, but I, I agree with you totally that the, uh, we really need to look closely at this. And my only point is that, my only point is that whereas the, uh, nobody's really seriously challenging what, what uh, your team has to say about the COVID and because simply the results are just too good, so mm -hmm. really. Um, but that's not the case in the, the, the whole uh, reform arena is really contentious. There's wild stuff flying around all the time. And it's just my, my only point is we need to have somebody that we can, that everybody in the state can believe beginning to weigh in on this. That's just my opinion. So thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ham. That's it. Uh, thank you all for tuning in. We'll see you again on Friday.